All right, everybody, I am here with Marco D'Ambrosio, um, head of Mar Marco Co. He, um, he's a composer. And um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Marco, for taking time out of your schedule to um, talk with me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you yeah, for having no me. So um, just to kind of give some introduction and some background here, how did you get started? as a composer, how did um, Marco Co come to be? Um, well, it's been a while now, but um, you know, I started off uh, as a kid, as a trumpet player and uh, you know, love playing the trumpet, still love playing the trumpet. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a whirlwind story, but um, you know, basically, I was uh, in high school, kind of doing all the band stuff and and really into music. And you know, initially, um, I uh, you know had maybe my sights on being an orchestral trumpet player. You know, I grew up in Boston, so you know, of course, the Boston Symphony is you know one of the best orchestras in the world. Uh, definitely the, the country, but there are many fine orchestras all over the place uh, in this country. But, you know, so I, I grew up listening to, you know, the Boston Symphony. I was into classical music. Of course, I was into, you know, rock and jazz as well. But, um, but you know, I originally was thinking about just uh, being a trumpet player, uh, not just, it's a, it's a big job. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, about the time I was hitting my junior, senior year, a movie came out that, that really changed my life. I tell, you know, students and people that ask me, you know, what, you know, how, you know, what, what, what did it for you? And it was, uh, it was the original Blade Runner of, of all films. Um, and uh, really what it was is uh, what really struck me was the kind of the combination of um, acoustic, you know, instruments, orchestra and electronics. Right. And so it was a really, uh, you know, for that time, an amazing blend and, and a, a innovative use uh of that. And so that really kind of captured my attention. And I said, you know, this is what I want to do. Um, and um, of course, at the time, there were no film scoring programs like there are now, you know, and uh, you sort of had to come up from, uh, you know, various routes to become a film composer. Um, so I wound up uh, going to uh, uh, school being a double major. Um, actually, uh, I, I knew that I, you know, I kind of knew early on that technology would, would play a huge part in music making as a, especially with, you know, film scoring. Um, and so I, and, you know, I, academically I was pretty good. So I basically wound up uh, going to, uh, to school that allowed me to do a double major. Um, and so I, I majored in actually majored in engineering and music um, at the university of Hartford. Um, and, you know, I, uh, wasn't a, a composition major per se. I took, you know, a lot of theory classes and, you know, I played, of course I played trumpet, but then I was also going to, um, I was also, you know, going to, you know, engineering classes. Um, and then the sort of icing on the cake really was, um, pretty much my first week of school there. I wound up getting a job in the recording studio at the school at the music school. So to me, that sort of like pulled it all together. Um, and so I just sort of, you know, kept that going. And um, I, I, you know, graduated from college. Uh, I did kind of uh, a, a, a straight engineering stint for a while. And then, you know, I, I keep telling people it's sort of the, uh, it's, it's the sum of your experiences that bring you to where you are, you know, and everybody's road is different. And, um, you know, what wound up happening is, uh, to make it short, uh, uh, as a combination of my, my musical skills, my, you know, creative skills and my technical skills, I wound up being able to um, land a job at, at Lucasfilm, at Skywalker. Um, and that was uh, really what, you know, kind of got things started for me. Um, and that was back in 19, man, I'm dating myself back in 1989, but I was just a kid. So um, anyway, uh, so, you know, I wound up uh, working at Skywalker. Um, I worked for a group called THX, which I'm sure some of you guys might be familiar, the whole THX sound thing. Um, and I was, uh, it was a very interesting creative time because like myself, there were a lot of, you know, technical slash creative people around. And, you know, we all had our jobs there, but we all did all these other projects. And, um, and so it really got, 
uh, that's what helped me get started. Uh, and primarily, it was really like one of my first real uh, scoring gigs was from uh, uh, a great man named Ben Burt. And I don't know if you know who uh, Ben Burt is. So Ben is a you know one of the original sound. You know, if 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 there is a a father of sound design, he you know or an uh, you know a statesman of sound design, he would be one of them as he did all the original Star Wars sounds, right? So um, Ben is also a great filmmaker and he actually did documentaries. So um, Ben actually hired me for some uh, documentaries that he was uh, working on. And so that really sort of got my uh, foot in the door, so to speak, as a composer. Um, and, uh, and that led to other things, you know, being at Skywalker, there were projects coming in and uh, I started doing other projects and, you know, probably a linchpin project for me that got me kind of even further down the road was uh, when uh, an uh, early anime series came um, called Jojo's Bizarre Adventures. Um, and, uh, you know, I got to meet the director and the producers and we got along and I, you know, submitted some music and they really liked it. And, uh, you know, I basically got the, the gig of you know scoring the initial OVAs or this the you know the that the the initial series and uh, that was a you know that was really kind of what what really kind of pushed me one step further but that's really sort of the genesis of my my film composing I you know I've always been interested in music and I've always been writing you know but uh, you know uh, uh, film or writing for media has has sort of been one of my passions um, and. Uh, and yeah, so pretty much from the mid '90s till today, um, you know, I'm basically an independent composer, uh, and I still work at Skywalker. I do some conducting there, and uh, it's not, you know, it's just down the road for me. But I, you know, I also have a studio here that I've built, and um, yeah, and so we do a lot of different kinds of things, uh, you know, from you know, uh, independent film, feature film stuff to animation to episodic stuff. So you know. Uh, and we just uh, still, you know, love what we do. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, kind of hopping into the realm of JoJo, actually, I know probably as of recent, a lot of people have reached out because you worked on both the the OVAs, as you mentioned, and yeah. um, the film that came out in 2007, Phantom Blood. Yeah, um, yeah. But what was it like working on jojo as a whole because actually a couple of weeks ago i talked with um tom myers and yep you right. mentioned you two were kind of collaborating together getting getting all that worked out and um what was what was your experience like working with the jojo franchise it was great you know and it was uh you know it was obviously it was it was definitely um a push into the world of post-production with schedules and you know, deadlines and stuff like that. Um, but as from a creative st standpoint, I had, I had a blast, you know, it was uh, very much, uh, you know, free reign. And, and, and I, maybe what I say by free reign is, I guess, you know, I had a concept of what I thought the music for Jojo should be. And they, they, everybody seemed to buy off on it, you know? And so, you know, it's kind of establishing that early sound for Jojo, uh, was really a lot of fun. And then, you know, and then Tom is still one of my great friends today. Right. So, you know, we, we developed a, a strong bond and uh, you know, it was, it was crazy hard work sometimes. And, and, you know, we, we both worked hard to make both the, the music and sound, you know, work and fit. And um, yeah. And I think we both kind of grew up uh, or, or grew into our, our roles, you know, uh, with that show. Um and uh, yeah, but I mean, there's, there's, you know, it really was a, a, a cool, I look back and, and, and even then I knew I go, you know, that I, I know nobody knows about this show, uh, but it's so kind of wacky and, and, and fun and just, you know, off the wall that, you know, somebody's going to watch this someday. And sure enough, you know, I think, you know, I feel happy and, and proud that we sort of got that the series kind of started, you know, kicked it off the ground, so to speak. And uh, I'm glad to see it has a life now, you know, it, it's actually, it's, it's sort of cycled back to me for sure. Um, in terms of people actually going back to the original OVAs and, and, you know, listening to the, the wacky stuff that I did. Yep. So um, <laughs> how, 
I mentioned this to Tom how um, there, I asked him kind of how how it if there was a difference in the experience between working on the episodic OVAs and then compared to the feature length film because um, uh, I lost my train of thought. I apologize, but um, oh, it's okay. But um, yeah, was there any sort of difference in experience between doing half hour long episodes and then the the uh feature length film yeah i mean the i the the scope was i mean essentially you know it it it, it was a relate it you know the the film is obviously related to the series right um uh the the biggest difference was, was you know there's a um uh, a time difference in when the, the, the film happened and and there's also kind of a bigger scope to it, you know, feature film, when you're working on films, they, they, you sort of, you know, think about the sound for a bigger screen, for a bigger canvas. Um, and so really the, you know, the biggest difference was from maybe the, you know, the, uh, you know, if, if you kind of ask me the music that I did for the OVAs, it was, I, I like to say, you know, I like the, use the term I like, I, I did 12 tone heavy metal, you know, I did sort of a combination of contemporary classical mixed with, uh, you, you know, kind of a, a modern, uh, at least for the time, you know, modern uh, rock, hard rock vibe, you know, just by the, the you know, the, the characters and the imagery and all that stuff. Um, with uh, the film, it was very much almost a, it was very much a period piece, right? In a way, it's set in the 1800s. And so we actually went for a bigger palette. We went for a full orchestra. Um, and, uh, you know, we wind up, you know, full on recording a, a, a real full orchestra. We went to uh, Prague for about a week to record that. So um, that's the biggest, that's the biggest difference. I mean, the process was about the same. I mean, there were, I mean, the, it was a little, uh, um, as I recall, there was uh, just kind of usual give and take with uh, deadlines, especially in deliveries, especially with animation. So we were necessarily working to the, the, the most complete picture by the time we were done. So they were still working. They were still working on it by the time we were almost done ourselves. So uh, that's, the, you know, that's the, the, the difference there. Yeah. That actually kind of ties into my next question. Um, I reached out, um, you mentioned students earlier. You're, um, when I was doing my initial research, it said you were a, um, a professor at the yeah. Academy of Art University, right? Yeah. And um, I reached out to one of your students, actually. Um, Erickson Zamora was his name. And okay. On his YouTube channel, he had, he uploaded something that was part of like a fifth semester project. And it was this, this 16 minute long um, thing of footage from Phantom Blood. And it, it had nothing except the animation and your score on it. But um, Mr. Zamora had to like do the actual sound design for it. And um, my curiosity is honestly pretty peaked because this footage has been around since 2012 and the story about how that 16 minute we we a lot of us just started calling it a work print at this point but yeah it was yep um yeah a lot of us were just kind of confused like how did this work print just get out there like how how did it come to be and the only the only real thread to the story that we have is that someone was at the academy of our university they had ties to another pushpin planning and then we found out that it was you this um the student had like a substitute professor or something like that the rabbit hole just got deeper and deeper so i i just kind of yeah. ask about the 16 minute work print and how that yep. how that whole thing kind of got started gotcha well maybe you know maybe that uh you know, maybe that posting on YouTube sh maybe should have not have happened. I mean, you, you know, I use that as a teaching material, which, you know, basically I'm allowed to do, you know, for academic purposes. Uh, but then, you know, finally, I guess that kind of got 
leaked out and you know there was a, a directive you know pretty much not to do that um but yeah i mean it basically i used it as uh, a music editing tool to show you know i, I basically um and it wasn't even a full clip because of what i wound up doing was i gave him my score i gave him the clip and then i showed him what it was originally and and then i edited the clip um uh, and then I told them, okay, make the music fit. So that was really that exercise. But, um, uh, uh, you know, it's possible that that material stayed at the, I'm no longer there. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually um, teaching at the conservatory right now. Um, and, uh, and so it's possible that that material was still used after I was gone. And maybe that's how it got leaked out. Uh, but that's that's basically it. But you know, technically, for you know, uh, with uh, with this thing we call fair use for academic purposes, you know, you're allowed to do that. But you know, then it gets released out in this crazy streaming world, and it and it goes, you know, and 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 sure enough, people hunt it down and 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 find some stuff. So I think that's basically probably what happened. I certainly didn't, uh, I don't give permission to do that. Um, yeah. Like, I kind of hate to put Zamora on blast there. Then. <laughs> I, um, you mentioned that you edited the um, the clip. Theoretically speaking, I don't mean to sound like greedy or anything like that. Is there a possibility that someone still has the original clip? Or is it just kind of lost to time at this point? Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, it's 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 possible. I'm not. You know, I I don't know if uh, I know. I you know, I've got the material. It wouldn't be right for me to release it because it's you know it's uh, it was a you know I was a a person hired to work on the project, so you know I wouldn't and couldn't release it. Um, I don't know if you know former students have it. Um, or not, but uh, you know, in uh, in reality, I would probably say I, I you know wouldn't recommend you know them releasing it. And I know there's people that would love to see it, but you know, I think if anything, they should see you know the film as it was intended. Um, but I'm glad there's you know I'm glad there's interest. I'm not you know I, I'm totally uh, happy that there's such a fan base and, and and eagerness to know more about the world of jojo you know because it is a it is an interesting one indeed <laughs> yeah and um kind of a funny story about the work print actually what i this was while i was in high school i had just finished watching fist of the north star and i was like okay i want to I want to watch something that's kind of similar to this because i really liked it it was full of action yep. you know and someone told me about Jojo and I looked it up, found out the first part was called Phantom Blood. And the first thing I found was that work print on YouTube. And I'm just like, okay, there's no dialogue. What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> but I, um, I've been looking along with is essentially a niche part of the community. We've been looking for this film and hoping to see as it was intended for let's say it's been around two to three years now yeah it's just the further we go the rabbit hole just keeps going deeper and deeper and <laughs> yeah I, I mean i you know i can tell you that we you know we were definitely working to incomplete picture when we wrapped it up you know and i think i, I think tom you know would, would tell you the same thing i mean there, there was you know missing footage or just you know uh, working to storyboards and so ultimately you know, I don't know what the, the final outcome of the release was, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, on to uh, and if you're and, it, and actually so the Fist of the North Star thing, there's actually we wound up or I wound up doing uh, a related series to that called Fist of the Blue Sky. And I don't know if you, you, you've checked that out, but that's a that, that's a related show. Yeah, yeah I, I haven't watched it yet, but I um, as part of my search for Phantom Blood and its related material, I got a couple of Japanese DVDs for it, but it didn't have any ads for Phantom Blood. But I can say they, well, I shouldn't say I've seen Fist of the Blue Sky, but 
I did get like a taste for what it was, what the animation was like, what the sound design was like, and things of that nature. Cool. Yeah. Um, um, I'm almost done with the JoJo related questions, but um, okay. Um, was there any sort of like a like a language barrier you had to this? This doesn't even just have to apply to JoJo, but to any international like foreign works was there any sort of language barrier you had to hop over or did they have translators ready for you or how did that work out yeah they they they, they had translators and actually i wound up you know some of them are still my friends today and, and you know we work closely with uh the the translators um you know there was uh, you know again i was in uh i think i must have been in my mid late 20s or something when I was doing that um uh but uh uh culturally it was interesting you know I learned a lot cult you know there was a uh, cultural things to learn about and and that was a great experience for me just learning about uh kind of Japanese culture and um their uh views on animation and anime and, and manga you know I I came I, you know I actually loved comic books when I was a kid you know, I, and I grew up in Italy, you know, and so the, in Italian, they call them fumetti, right? And so, you know, I would, I would look at comic books as, as a kid and it actually kind of being introduced to the, to the manga kind of brought me back to that, right? And, 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 and you know, of course, when I, I moved to this country when I was six or seven years old, Cutting out there, Marco. But once I started looking at the, the the manga, I go, yeah, this is the 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 same thing. So it was really uh, a path that does, you know, an affinity for those things, right? And they're they're visually kind of uh, stimulating. So I, I enjoy that. Um, uh, so, but back to your question, you know, we did have. Um, we did have translators and, and so, and they helped us both, you know, language wise and, and culturally as well. And, um, I learned a little bit about, you know, tastes and, and what, you know, and, and really good music is good music, no matter how, you know, you, you slice it and, um, you know, and maybe that's what people get attracted to, you know, especially the, the, uh, a, a kind of American audience being attracted to the animes because, you know, there is, there's a, a high level of, or uh, a memorable value to that music in a lot of the, the shows. So I, I think that there's a, there, there's something there. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, we had translators um, and, you know, for pretty much for uh, pretty much for all the shows that I, you know, I've worked on, there's always been sort of an inter intermediary, um, up to a point, and then you know, I can I can tell you that uh, you know I, when I when I worked on uh, Vampire Hunter D, um, you know there was a little bit of uh, a curve to sort of you know Yoshiaki Kawajiri to me is a grand master you know of uh, Japanese animation, and he actually came to my studio and and you know it, I was really nervous and and all that stuff, and then you know we had a translator, and then by the end it's like the translator didn't have to be in the room; we just kind of understood each other on a different level, you know, and we were all like, you know, singing Beatles songs together and all this stuff. So um, uh, I think, you know, uh, translation is good, but then, you know, there's stuff that kind of transcends language, which is cool. Uh, and and I, I try to, you know, reach that level with everybody I work with. Yeah. Um, uh, lost my train of thought again. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, so obviously, Phantom Blood as a film isn't viewable right now. But um, I was talking with a friend of mine. He said he reached out to you and said that um, he he told me that you told him that that um, excuse me that there's a chance that you'd be able to release the Phantom Blood. Um, soundtrack is that still a possibility or 
Yeah, you I mean I, I've tried to, you know, uh, I, I've tried to bring it up uh, a few times, and 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 myself personally have not gotten responses, you know, and I I don't, you know, and and maybe you know maybe there's a rabbit hole that is deeper than even I I know about, you know, so. Uh, I did say that and I would love to release it. I mean, I, I think that the score turned out really well. Um, I just couldn't do that without permission. And so I've sort of asked about that, but have never gotten uh, a reply. And sometimes, you know, uh, when you don't get a reply, it's a subtle way of, of, of saying no. Um, so I, you know, I, I try to be as, uh, you know, I try to be gentle with my requests and, and, and hopefully some, you know, that could happen someday, you know, the more time goes by, you know, uh, the more people see it as, as, a, as a value. And I, I would love to, you know, so I'll keep, I'll keep kind of probing gently. And then, you know, certainly when the day comes that that can be released, I would, I would do it. So, yeah. All right. Um, in the last Jojo related question. <laughs> um, um, would there be anyone that you could refer me to in order to kind of inquire about Phantom Blood and its whereabouts and how it was made, anything in that regard? Um, there was only one, well, besides Tom, the only other name that, that stood out to me, and I actually didn't remember this until I was looking back at some of the stuff we had archived, um, Christopher Barrick was his name. He had this nickname, the Bear. And, Bear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was, it was literally how it showed up in the credits. It was this. Um, I don't know if you remember this or if you worked on it. There was a sort of a teaser for the film back in two thousand and four. So three, three. Yeah, I worked on it. Yep, and in the credits it said. Uh, sound effects um christopher bear christopher the bear barrick i don't know if he's still um doing that sort of stuff if i'd be able to talk to him or if there are any other names or people that you could possibly refer me to um yeah i mean bears bears a character i love bear um you might be able to you, you might be able to find him uh you know and 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 he might you know want be able to tell you what he knows. I mean, Bear is basically part of our crew um, and uh, fun guy to, you know, hardworking, fun guy. Um, and, uh, you know, may not pretty much, I can, you know, I safely say may, might not know much more than we do, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, yeah, but we did, uh, we did work on that teaser together. That was, uh, we mixed actually mixed that at Skywalker. That was one of the the probably loudest trailer mixes we've ever done. Um, and uh, it was uh, pretty intense. It was, but I thought it turned out, it turned, it was cool. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, uh, how far you'll get trying to reach the, the producers, you know, they, they tend to be pretty, you know, kind of silent about this kind of stuff and, and kind of stand back. And, uh, but, you know, I can, uh, you know, maybe see who's, if anybody's willing to talk um, about what's, what happened or, you know, the, the rabbit holes, as you say. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, um, I can't think of anybody else. I mean, really sort of the two main guys, at least on the post-production side, you know, and, and on this side of the, the pond would be Tom and I. Um, and, you know, we're honestly telling you all that we know. <laughs> um. Um, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because um, before I reached out to Tom and you, I actually sent an email or a couple of emails, both to um, AP3 and Clockworks, just trying to say, hey, I'm, um, I'm looking for this film. I'm just wondering what happened to it and if it would still be able to be released in some fashion and I never yep. heard back from them so my next big thing that I want to do assuming that Japan's borders open back up is to fly over there and inquire about it directly but we'll see how long yeah. that takes to actually happen <laughs> that would be a that, that would be a, a big that would be your bizarre adventure man that, that would be uh, that would be big um, and you know honestly that's 
that was something I would love to, uh, both myself and my family, is to bring them over there. I did get to spend some time there. Uh, well, actually, while we we're working on JoJo, we had like a, a week of like storyboard review and that kind of stuff. And I had an amazing experience. You know, it was, it was pretty, uh, and, and I learned a lot, you know, it, it sort of, I, I learned a lot more about the culture and, and that stuff. So it was, um, it was definitely worthwhile. I highly recommend, you know, if, if you're into, you know, anime or Japanese culture, the experience it firsthand. Yep. Yep. Even outside of, my search for phantom blood i've always just wanted to go to japan anyway so if anything this is just another step closer to crossing something off my bucket list <laughs> yeah um, yeah if and if you can you know go there with uh somebody that it has some knowledge you know that's even better you know that, i guess that's that's what really helped for me is like i wasn't didn't necessarily go as a tourist you know i went there met a translator and we were working so we sort of were ingrained in the the, you know, the, we, we were part of the culture, you know, we, we got a, a, a good view of it from, you know, from the, from the ground, from the ground floor, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, kind of going back to your work as a, um, professor, what did you teach while at, um, the Academy of Art? Um, I taught, uh, I, I did, I taught, I, I think, there I taught, um, I believe I taught a film music history class, you know, sort of give uh, students a, a, a breadth of the, the span of film scoring from, you know, from silent films um, to, you know, modern day. That was one of the classes I taught. Um, I taught, an, uh, I did teach a sort of a scoring for dramatic media. Um, and then I taught a, uh, I believe a music editing class. Um, and like I said, and now, you know, I'm at the conservative, the San Francisco conservatory where I'm teaching, a, it's a program called TAC technology and applied composition. And it is very much, you know, a, a writing from media based, but it, it's basically incorporating, you know, comp composition, uh, to, uh, and technology, um, you know, which is you know, it's a, the program's four years old and it's, it's, it's cool. It's sort of bringing that, that technological component to a conservatory setting. So, you know, we have students that are classically trained that have, you know, great compositional chops and sort of giving them that next step um, in terms of integrating that into, you know, modern day. Right. And so you look at, you know, where, where is that, where are the opportunities and, you know, video games is huge, you know, for that. Um, and so uh, there, there is a, a big video game component, but also scoring for all kinds of media, right? Look at all the, look at how much program we have now with all the streaming stuff and, um, you know, all the interactive stuff. And, and, and so, you know, kind of giving classically trained uh, or, or, you know, mu musicians with a formal background and even not, you know, there, there's, we, we, uh, you know, people come from all different aspects um, and come to the school and just sort of get a, a good foundation. So, yeah. So I just sort of, you know, to me, it's like, I'm not an academic person per se. I mean, I, I'm very much a composer, conductor, music guy in the, in the, in the trenches, so to speak. And I just like to sort of show, you know, I, I didn't necessarily, it was, it was so hard for me to sort of get into this um, when I started that I sort of feel like, you know, I would like to make it maybe easier for other folks, at least in terms of you know, the, what I know, you know, the knowledge. and and everybody's approach is different, right? And there's a lot of great film composers, great media composers, and everybody has their own kind of way, but at least I can, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem sharing my, my way of, of doing things. I'm, you know, only around for a while and I, I'm luckily busy with projects. And so, you know, there, there's, there's should be room for anybody who wants to express themselves, you know? All right. And um, you mentioned a, a technological component. What kind of uh, programs do you use in that regard? Yeah, lots of stuff. Um, well, so I don't know if you can see it, but first of all, you can look up behind me. Um, you look up and up above those panels. I don't know if you can see that, yeah, but yeah. that's kind of, that's like a, a little bit of a museum. That is my, that's actually pretty much, that pretty much models my original JoJo setup, which is like all this, uh, 
you know, analog gear and, um, you know, m- you know, MIDI when you actually had to, you know, work outside of a computer to get all your sounds, you know, with keyboards connected to a, an interface. And so, you know, that, and, and there's stuff up there that predates MIDI, right. That basically, uh, you know, things like, uh, uh, Moog, uh, you know, Moog synthesizers, Oberheim's, uh, original 808, you know, stuff that you, you actually had to program manually and then had to, you know, perform and record, uh, onto some kind of media that's not, it wasn't like recallable on a computer anyway. So, um, that's sort of my Genesis. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, of course, we've we've evolved into the modern day of, you know, working within a, a workstation or a DAW, uh, a computer uh, setup. Um, and there's, you know, m- not many, but there's some, you know, uh, uh, smattering of applications out there that that do it right. And so um, I started off working with a program called digital performer still use that a bit um but uh, you know a lot of my work winds up going to post houses you know uh, post-production mix houses so ultimately stuff winds up getting recorded and mixed in pro tools um i also use apple logic quite a bit Uh, i've dabbled with ableton live which i know is a popular program and a lot of folks are using it so you know but my i guess my main tools right now would be um I mean, if I look at my current project, it's basically I'm um, using uh, a little bit of Logic, uh, Pro Tools, and then you know we're getting ready to do a recording session here in a few weeks uh, with a small orchestra, and so ultimately that's got to get turned into sheet music that you know musicians can read. And so there's a I use a notation program that's related to the Pro Tools stuff called Sibelius, um, and uh, that's kind of you know my flow, and uh, yeah, that's basically. Uh, my my stuff and then you know there's obviously there's plugins for all these DAWs that allow you to make sounds right so there's uh, synth plugins there's uh, virtual sample instrument libraries and uh, you know I've got a smattering of all that stuff a lot of different programs that I use there yeah um kind of tying into that um have you ever done live performances of any of your works or is that just mostly tied behind the studio? No, I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to, and I have done a little bit. I've done some, um, I've, I've done actually not, man, I've done a few programs with, uh, with schools. Like I actually did uh, a silent film score, which was really fun. I do play live. I play with a band. Uh, we don't necessarily play my, my film score stuff. Um, but, you know, I kind of look in, for that to do more of that in the in the future you know a lot of times you know i'm here in the studio you know going from one deadline to the next and so i basically try to get out and, and play my horn with some folks as much as i can but i'm mostly here um but that being said you know i would love to do more of that right so uh i look for you know hopefully someday there'll be an opportunity you know maybe we'll be able to do the phantom blood score live someday that would be awesome <laughs> that would that would take uh that would take us a, a good orchestra a, a good size orchestra i should say yeah it would, it would probably take take a little bit of finagling too with rights and stuff but yeah yeah and that's the other thing you know so I'll, I'll, you know I'll, i do all kinds of projects on all different levels i'll work on you know smaller indie indie films and uh, documentary stuff and then some bigger you know, studio stuff. And then, you know, usually the bigger the project, the, the less, you, the less you own, you know, you, it becomes a, a work for hire where obviously you get paid and get, get paid well, but you sort of give away the, the publishing and then it's, it's, they own it. Uh, and, and essentially that is, uh, that is the case with, I believe with Phantom Blood. So, yeah. And, um, Um, hang on, brain's catching up. <laughs> yep. No worries. Do you, um, do you still do, or uh, do people still reach out to you to do compositions for animation or has it mostly been like documentaries and live stuff lately? Or is there kind of a choice behind that? Yeah, no, I, I actually, there's some stuff coming up that is more animation based. There's some. I can't, there's one project I can't 
talk about too much, um, which is an animation project. But um, you know, one one anime project that is we're trying to get off the ground, which we uh, actually did a, a small pilot for, which I would love to work. I hope it takes off. Which is it, it's a it's kind of a genre of music I really want to explore. Um, there's a um, another you know master named Kenichi Sonoda Sonoda San. Um, who uh, originally uh, did um, uh, a series called Gunsmith Cats um, back in the in, in the day, and so uh, he has been able to again a rights thing. He was actually able to uh, reacquire um, his uh, characters, uh, not so much the series, but he was you know his character design and his characters, and so. Uh, we did uh, a small pilot called Bean Bandit um, that we uh, introduced at uh, pre-COVID, right? The, co the year before everything shut down at the Anime Central in Chicago, um, we released a, a short pilot. Um, and so that's kind of in the works. And we're hoping that really takes off because it would be a total blast to, to work on. It's basically, you know, car, you know, cars you know it's a, it's a it's basically a, a car very much a car uh show um and kind of a, a little bit you know a little bit of that 70s 80s 90s i mean it's hard to, but a little bit of that funk cool funk rock vibe you know um which would be fun so i would i would try to put together like a a rock band with a horn section you know uh, and, and a lot styled a lot like the detective shows of like the seventies, you know, which, which had kind of smaller ensembles, smaller groups, but it was really cool, funky stuff. Um, and actually, so this series actually set in the nineties. So I would get a little, you know, maybe a little t electronic on it as well, which would be fun, but just that, that hybrid. So that, that there's one. And then there's another project that, you know, as time goes on, hopefully we'll, will uh, be able to uh, uh, get out in the world, which is very a very different show, uh, more along uh, the lines of Vampire Hunter D. So uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and um, it sounds really interesting. And it, I heard like, <laughs> what? As soon as I heard cars and 90s in the same sentence, the first thing that I thought of, and I'm sure a couple of friends of mine probably thought would think the same thing is um initial d <laughs> so that's that's kind of more on the side of like like um fast-paced techno and almost dance in a way but um, that's, that's kind of the the first image that popped in my, popped into my head yeah th this would have a little bit of that but i'd say it's it's more a little rooted in like uh you know uh, well, it's set in Chicago, so it's a little grittier, a little funkier, a little bluesier, you know, a little rockier than the the pure electronica stuff of 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 the '90s, you know. So it's it's maybe yeah, I think that that that's probably a good point. It maybe would have its roots uh, in in the blues, right, in the old Chicago blues scene, um, and just kind of kick that up a notch. And you know, Chicago blues scene is still active, it's still it's 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 still a thing, right? And uh, uh, and so just kind of you know, bringing some of that vibe and culture. And that's, an, and that's a cool part about anime too, is like, you know, there's a whole kind of, uh, affinity, you know, it's, 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 it's a Japanese art form in, in its sense, but it's sort of this sort of interpretation of Western culture too, you know, so that it, that's a cool, uh, mishmash. And here I am, you know, kind of an Italian American composer thrown into the mix, um, uh, which, uh, which is fun too. So, <laughs> Yeah, um, it's actually a, a large majority of the questions that I have, but as we're kind of wrapping up here, do you have any advice for any aspiring composers out there? I, you know, without, you know, and as a teacher, you know, without sounding cliche and, and you know, everything already tells you, it, it is true. I mean, it's sort of, if it's something that you love to do, just keep keep doing it and 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 I, and I do go back to you know it's sort of not trying to compare yourself to anybody or your anything or any timeline you know and um 
just sort of find what you love to do and just keep keep doing it. And uh, and again, it, it is the sum of your experiences that's going to make you different. You know, so maybe you know you're uh, maybe you're growing up, uh, you know, in a farm in the Midwest, and and that's you know that's something that you should absorb into your 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 work. That's different from somebody you know growing up. Uh, in an urban environment, you know, and that makes them different or, you know, having, you know, mixed uh, race or mixed gender parents, you know, that's like, it's all valid and it's all makes you different. So, and, and I think, you know, just, just be you, you know, that's the one thing I tell my students, like, don't, you know, there's, uh, there are, we, you know, we already have a Hans Zimmer, we already have a John Williams, we already have a Danny Elfman, right. And it's, it's great to learn what they do and they do their stuff beautifully, you know, beautifully well and they do all kinds of interesting projects but you know do d learn that learn what how they do it um oh did i lose you yeah i'm going running low on battery but um i might need to plug in uh but yeah but just find 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 your thing you know maybe maybe you know you add vocals to your stuff more than other people or maybe you make crazy percussion you know so just just you know find find your niche and just enjoy it you know that, and i know some of that it might sound a little cliche but i you know i try to do that i try, i try to keep going myself and say i am who i am and this is how i do it and you know i there's people that like my stuff which is great and and I'll, i try to help as much as i can so yeah yeah and i'm i i honestly never think there's anything wrong with cliche statements you, sure you might hear it all the time but the statement remains standing they call the cliche for a reason because it's it's just something that bears repeating yeah yeah nah, yeah exactly just you know just be a you know more than anything just be a good person you know and like try to get along with everybody on this planet that's that's the that's the other thing and 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 don't let me get environmental because i'll start talking about the planet but you know it's all it's all it's all related <laughs> yeah <laughs> um that's all I have, actually. Um, do you have any questions for me before we go ahead and sign off here? Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for uh, your, you know, your of an artist such as myself. So, Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, th thank you for taking time out of your schedule. It's especially in these days when everyone's crunched with deadlines, everyone's busy. Well, mostly everyone's yeah. busy but <laughs> yeah i mean you know it, we're we all uh we all strive to find that uh, elusive you know zen balance of of things and i can't not sure that it, it it's uh it, it's it's something to aspire to and try to but uh, you know whether it's actually achievable is a, a different story but it's always good to to keep trying to find that you know nice sort of level state of existence so that's the end goal <laughs> yeah and good luck to you that's uh, you know keep uh keep 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 going down that rabbit hole <laughs> oh yeah I've, I've got my mental digging shovel still ready and i'm still digging as we speak so <laughs> yeah and on you know honestly if i if i get to a point where it's comfortable to release something you know it's i'm not i have I would love to, you know, I'm not holding anything back. So, Yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> well, th thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Good, good luck to you and happy holidays. All right. Okay. <laughs> yep. Happy holidays. Take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.